Today, it's great to chat with Ed Catmull on the podcast. Ed is the co-founder of Pixar Animation Studios and is former president of Pixar Animation and Disney Animation. He has been honored with five Academy Awards, including the Gordon E. Sawyer Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Field of Computer Graphics. Ed received his PhD in Computer Science from the University of Utah and is the author of Creativity, Inc., Overcoming the Unseen Forces that Stand in the Way of True Inspiration. He lives in San Francisco with his wife and children. Ed, so excited to chat with you today. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, so many potential starting points. Um, we have so many mutual interests, uh, and including, you know, creativity is a big mutual interest we have in the creative process. Uh, but I really want to kind of get more of like the the humanity out of you a little bit to begin with. Um, you were you were a child growing up in the 50s in Utah. Is that right? That's right. I was born in yeah. West Virginia, but I, uh, as soon as the war was over, my father came out and got my <clears throat> mother from where she was in West Virginia and moved out to Utah. And I spent and you, half my life there. Spent half of your life there. And, and even t- as a kid, you were inspired by Disney movies, right? And that it made you want to be a Disney animator someday. Yeah, it was the early days of television back in the 50s. Mm-hmm. Um, there was the, well, the Disneyland, uh, followed by the you know, wonderful world of color. <laughs> Uh, but it was a weekly event to watch Walt Disney as, as well, of course, to see the movies that were produced. Do you, um, did you watch Fantasia when you were a kid, the original one? Uh, yeah, yes. I watched all of them. And uh, uh, for me, they were very inspirational. There was also a phenomenon which I didn't discover until many years later. But I'd probably say the two most impactful films on me as a child were Pinocchio and uh, Peter Pan. Mm. Now, the phenomenon I noticed as an adult was that I went back and watched them after not having seen them. Because remember, for a long time, there was no video or DVD. <laughs> and they had this uh, 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 thing of scheduling their films every um seven years for the Africa release so I didn't I hadn't seen them for a long time then I went back and I watched them and I had these vivid memories of these movies and when I saw them again as an adult the things I remembered from the film were not in the movies I had made them up and I, and I thought oh that's pretty cool and that's what kids do is there is they've got something which is stimulating their imagination and then it gets in there and it gets mixed in with the stuff that they actually saw and that's actually the way a lot of life is in any case it's a good thing you make me want to revisit some of the uh my my favorite movies as a kid i probably made up a lot of stuff that i think was in it (laughs) i I hope so i hope so yeah um, cool little trivia for you. My grandfather was in the original Fantasia um, because he was uh, with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And so he was one of the cellists with, uh, with Stokowski, uh, I believe, was the conductor. Yes. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So a little, a little trivia there. Uh, now, you, your first entree point into, uh, into this world um, was embracing the emerging field of computer graphics. But that must have been really primitive computer, you know, like when you were there in, like in, you studied in college, is that right? Computer graphics? Yeah, the, the order of things was that I wanted to be an artist. And I was, I was, I think, the best artist in the school, but I was nowhere near what uh, I saw coming out of Disney. And there were no schools for animation. Mm. So uh, when I entered college, I switched over to physics. Um, and, uh, and Einstein was the other iconic figure to me that growing up the fifties, it was Einstein and, uh, and Walt Disney. It's like talking about iconic in terms of their look, like, uh, you know, what we thought of them and their impact and the world and in the culture. So I studied in physics, but near the end of, of college, 
there was this new field of computer science. So um, I, and I'd taken a lot of courses. I had enough courses to get two bachelor's degrees um, in the four years. I took, I took a lot of classes. I loved school. Um, so I got two degrees. One was in computer science and the other was in physics. But um, there was something about computer science. And one of the reasons I switched to it was that I wanted to be on the frontier. And with physics, um, the frontier was pretty hard slog to get to. Whereas in computer science, it was brand new. Like, like we were at the frontier at the time. Uh, but it was in graduate school that I came back intending to study um, computer languages, potentially artificial intelligence. And, and my first class at the University of Utah was in computer graphics, which is where the foundations were laid for the field. So as soon as I took that course, then boom, everything fell into place. It's like, oh, you, you can make art with this. But we were early on. <clears throat> I mean, we're talking about line drawings. <clears throat> or in the case of things that weren't line drawings, they were, they were polygons. And uh, the state of things was that every graduate student was expected to push things forward. And my, the task that I wanted was to make it so that I could make curved surfaces and curved patches. And they didn't know how to do it at the time. There wasn't the technology in place. Well, this is exciting. So it didn't matter if like it was really crude. The way I looked at it at the time, this isn't rewriting history, was that, oh, we're making this stuff up. That's exciting. But we, but we had long ways to go <laughs> and, and knew it at the time. And we knew what the barriers were. And one of the barriers being there wasn't enough compute power in order to make uh, highly realistic looking images. If I should, as well, if I there should. wasn't enough knowledge either. For sure. If if I went to that, if I could time travel and go back to that, that 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 guy, and I showed him uh, like Soul, the movie Soul, would 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 you have been like, like never have believed that such a thing is possible? Um, would he, how would he react if he could if he saw that if that guy saw what we what you've accomplished today? Well, if, uh, first of all, we've certainly gone farther than I would have guessed at the time. Yeah. So while I knew we were at the beginning of something big and that it was going to change, um, it, it's like a lot of things. The uh, the you, you don't know exactly where it's going. And the way I think about it, the way I still think about it, is that the, there's the, a, a an early question should be: Is this a significant area? Is, is this going to be a niche or is it going to be big? And then the other is what are the steps you take to get there? But you don't know where there is. Yeah. So you say, well, okay, there is a there. There's something important there. And there was no question about it. There was something important in terms of uh, being able to make high quality imagery without a doubt. But in going now to set the steps to get there while solving the problems, the concept of the long-term vision also alters. So if, if you can think about it, it's like there's an interplay or an interaction between the future and now. And you have to be comfortable with saying that that future is unknown and it's going to change. We don't know really what it is, but there's some place to go to. Okay, and, and now that we check in every once in a while on the long term vision, we put most attention on how do we solve the problems of today? I love that. Um, but just even going back to staying in your child for a second, you did make animation using flip books at one point, right? That was, yeah. uh, and and you and you did a bunch of really cool things. Like in in 1972, you made an animated version of your left hand, which was a big deal. That you, yes. that you did that, uh, right? <laughs> yes. It was, uh, and there was the, the class project, as I mentioned. The first year was to take the course in computer graphics. Hmm. And uh, in the second quarter, Utah had a quarter system. Um, I decided to make, uh, pick something which was really hard, which is to do this film of my left hand, 
which meant that I had to digitize it um, and make a model, uh, get the data in there, uh, and then write a little animation language for how I moved the hand about. And, uh, and it was a class project. <laughs> uh, but it was, uh, it, it was crude. I, kn I knew it was crude, but it, it wasn't, it, even the time, I know we're not measuring where we are now against this, this big vision. We're saying, are we, are we heading in the right direction? And so picking this particularly difficult task, even though today it looks crude, um, was for me a, a great step forward. And of the people in the class, only two people in that first class wrote everything from scratch. They were also the only two people that stayed in the field of computer graphics. Everybody else was using the packages that were provided to the students. And that was the, the, the distinguishing point was if you threw away the packages they gave and you wrote your own, that meant there was more passion. Fred Park was the other person. Hmm. That's so cool. And I believe that that actually um, it, it, it influenced the industry. Didn't they make a, um, a documentary or something someday or a movie that incorporated? Um, well, one of the first movies to use computer graphics in a significant way was Future World. Um, incidentally, as a movie, it sucked, just to be very clear. Fair I don't recommend going back and seeing this because... When, when I say it sucked, it was poor filmmaking uh, in there. But they wanted to have computer graphics, so uh, they asked for permission to use the handpiece as something that was in the film in the background while they're working in their their labs for these for the robots and so forth. So there was the picture of the hand rotating and doing that as a background piece. That must have been cool. That must have felt good. Thank you. I mean, uh -huh. in graduate in uh, sorry, what were you gonna say? No, go ahead. Yeah, in graduate school, you 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 set an explicit goal to make the first computer animated feature film. This was a goal that you had, right? Yes. Um. So so I just want to like we'll get to the pathway. We'll get to we'll get we'll we'll get up to Toy Story and and beyond. But it, let's talk about the year I was born, nineteen seventy nine. <laughs> George Lucas approaches you. Um, and he asks you uh, to lead a group of people to bring together computer graphics, video editing, and digital audio into the entertainment field. This was a, a big deal at the time. So, you know, what was that experience like to be approached to do that? You know, were you really super excited? Did you feel like you were moving towards this goal that you set yourself in grad school? Well, the interesting thing at, at the time was that the studios, um, all, all the studios had no interest whatsoever in any aspect of what George was trying to do. Mm. And, uh, and I talked with other studios in the past, including Disney, and it, what we were talking about was so irrelevant to them. There wasn't even that they were saying we shouldn't do that. It's like they weren't even in, didn't even want to have the discussion. It's just like it was, that was far off, how far off the radar it was. Um, so um, because of the success of Star Wars and because George had assembled a team of the people who were the very best at uh, the optomechanics and the chemistry of film um, and, and, and worked out how to get motion, motion blur, which is critical for mixing with live action for uh, uh, physiological reasons. So, these are the people who are the very best in the world. So George himself is not a technologist. He just said technology is going to change filmmaking and he got some money because Star Wars was successful. So he said he wants to invest in R&D in these areas. And he's the only person in the industry that did that and had the ability and the credibility to pull it off. Even if somebody had thought it was a possibility within one of the other studios, and in fact, I'm sure within Disney, there were people who said there's potential there, but they couldn't break through. But George Lucas was a force of his own. So uh, George uh, basically asked me to come in to lead the, these programs. Now, now, for me, it's like, 
holy cow, this is this is a real filmmaker, a, a person who really understands storytelling. Um, and uh, that's like the best possible um, uh, position one can be in. So the answer is like when the opportunity came, <clears throat> OK, I really I really did want it. It gave you a front row seat, you know, to uh, also, you know, to see all the emerging technologies at that time. Um, you also had a front row seat to a lot of software companies that would turn out to take over Silicon Valley in the coming years, right? That must have been a great experience. Yeah, there were uh, a lot of friends. I mean, there are a number of people that came out of the University of Utah. Uh, so John Warnock, who founded Adobe, came out of Utah. Oh. Um, Alan Kay, basically the founder of object-oriented programming, um, he went off to uh, Xerox Park and spent many years there. Um, so, uh, oh, and Jim Clark, who founded Silicon Graphics, was there. So it was a phenomenal group of students in this brand new field, uh, but, they, but we remained friends. So basically we, we could talk with each other afterwards. So there was that connection with the, the people in Silicon Valley. Um, but because we were with Lucasfilm and Lucasfilm itself had a lot of cachet, then that opened the doors to visit a lot of companies that were making you know, workstations or supercomputers or mini computers and as, as we progressed through it. Um, so it basically meant being in, involved with a lot of different kinds of people and just learning something from how it worked, what didn't work, um, what some of the mistakes were uh, and what the cultural issues were. So I, it's like uh, Microsoft was actually making uh, animated, short animated storytelling films to go on CD-ROMs. Um, and it was clear, as, as, as I knew these people, that the artists who were working there were second class citizens because fundamentally the company made its money from selling software. And so there was this class structure. At the same time, Disney was starting to use computer graphics, and so they had a computer team there. But it was very clear that the technical people were second class and the artists were first class. So, like, they're, they're flipped. And uh, so that's an interesting phenomenon. But in both cases, the people who were first class weren't actually trying to be mean or put somebody down. It's just like they had their job to do and they had their their preconceptions and what they knew and what they didn't know, but they ended up with this uh, unhealthy class structure. So one of the things we did as we built, uh, worked on, on Lucasfilm <clears throat> was to say, okay, how do we have internally a good balance on the technical and the artistic side, whether it's uh, imagery or uh, sound or, or, uh, or editing. So we worked a lot on, on trying to get that right. Now, having said that, there were three times in the history of Pixar where that, that class structure notion kind of creeps in. And it's like this insidious thing that gets into an organization. And, uh, but it was going through that process of obser observing what others did, figuring out how we fell into it. And when we didn't fall into it, the great benefit from having a healthy balance and understanding appreciation of what other people do. It must have felt like the Wild West to a certain degree of, um, of, 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 of the, the movie industry and, the, and all the technologies that were happening. Like anything seemed possible, right? Well, I, I, the analogy I used at the time was being at the front of the line of an Easter egg hunt. The Wild West people kept getting killed, so. Okay, that's a better analogy. I, I prefer that analogy. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. But that, that is what it felt like at the time, um, was that, wow, you can see all this stuff out in front of you, and, and they just cut the tape, and you're at the front of the line. So <laughs> how fast can you go out and gather eggs? Yeah. yeah. Interestingly uh, so enough, one of the things that was different between this and, and physics was, it's 50 years later, and we're still on the frontier. So you look at 
deep learning or what's happening with GPUs and the decreasing uh, cost and, and the, of, of sensors and the size of sensors and their ability, it's like things are still changing. And it's 50 years later. Okay, we, we're we still at the front of the line. It's pretty amazing. It's incredible. And it'd be incredible to see the next 50 years, but you know, we can talk uh, later about I'll try. the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're still in the 80s here right now in, in, in my head. So 1985, St St a, a young man by the name of Steve Jobs crosses your path. Um, he was working at Next. Um, he wasn't like, at that point, he... I mean, he wasn't uh, the Steve Jobs we know right now. Steve Jobs. I mean, he, he had he had left Apple. Um, what was sort of what is sort of your impression of him, and uh, and how was that interaction? Well, we we met him initially when he was still at Apple, and we oh, were introduced I see. by, by uh, Alan Kay. I mentioned he was your part, your part, but he was at Apple at the time. Um, he made the introduction at. And then he disappeared because of the things were going on. We didn't even know why, just like he's off the radar. We were trying to spin out as a separate company and uh, having a lot of difficulty. Um, and uh, after he left, uh, we met with him. He tried to buy us early on, but he wanted to turn us into a computer company. Hmm. And so uh, uh, Albert Ray Smith was my, uh, the partners, one of the co-founders of Pixar. So we declined. That's not what we wanted to do. So uh, um, we continued our path of trying to get funding to get bought out of Lucasfilm. And Steve formed Next. And then after he formed Next, then uh, I ran into him at a trade show in San Francisco. And uh, since he now got his computer company going, then um, we restarted our talks with each other. So it was a difficult and, st and stressful part of our lives because we we're trying to make sure we we're trying to hold our group together uh, to do uh, computer graphics. Uh, but in the early days, um, the, the, a lot of Steve was what you saw in, in terms of the reputation. And the unfortunate thing is that uh, it's kind of sexy to talk about that kind of behavior. So it tends to be the thing that predominates in books or stories or whatever because you want the drama of it. But it doesn't represent the most important story, which is that Steve went through probably one of the best examples of the hero's journey. So early on in his career, his behaviors and the way he worked with people wasn't very good. I mean, it's the reason he didn't work out with Apple. Um, and, including with you? Including with you? Well, I, you know, the interesting thing was, well, Steve and I disagreed. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, I'm not the sort that argues with somebody. I'm stubborn and I don't give up, but I don't argue. Mm. So um, um, I, I did have this conversation early on with Steve this, before we formed as a company. Um, and I was be the president. And I said, OK, so what happens when we disagree? And his answer was, well, I, what I found is if somebody doesn't understand something, I just keep explaining it to them until they understand it. <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is not a good sign. <laughs> no. <laughs> but the reality was that when he and I did disagree, that was exactly how I worked with him. Is that is, he would do something and he, would, he, he could think so much faster than I could that... Uh, that I would say something and then he would come back with something and then I'd end the conversation. And I'd have a week to think about the next sentence. <laughs> and then we'd talk about it and I'd bring it up and he'd immediately shoot it down. Um, and then over the period of you know, up to two or three months, then we kind of reach one of three uh, conclusions. One of them is that I would actually see that he was right. and. Uh, and I just say, oh, yeah, you're right. And then about a third of the time, he'd say, oh, you're right. I get it. And so, and that was, you know, then we did it. And the other third of the time, it's like he just gave up. Um, and, and he was actually fine with that. Like, if we didn't agree, what he did want was for somebody to know why they were doing it and have an opinion. 
And I came to appreciate that with Steve was that he did not want yes people around him. Mm. And it's not the conception that people normally have of Steve. But as Steve went through this building of Next and Pixar, fundamentally, we both failed at what our original charter as companies. And Steve did a number of things where he was really going for, you know, the home run of and the first ball or something like that. But over time, he learned lessons from He changed as a person. Um, when Pixar went public, uh, he, he controlled the board. <clears throat> I remember he, he fired two people off the board because they never argued with him. They never pushed back. That's amazing. So, uh, but he's such a powerful personality, you assume that he doesn't want the pushback. And what it means is he wants and needs more powerful people around him because he appreciated the power of pushback. And, and I'd say even when I first met him, he was instinctively knew that there is no upside to being wrong. <laughs> so as soon as he realized that, that the person actually had a point, he just switch on a dime because he was interested in the truth. He wasn't interested in being right. I mean, he wanted to be right because he was the follow from the truth, but the truth precedes being right. Hey everyone. I'm really excited to announce that athletic greens is a sponsor of this podcast. Athletic Greens is the most comprehensive daily nutritional beverage I've ever tried. I've been using their product religiously for the past seven years or so, and it consistently makes me feel healthier and more energized throughout the day. I can't recommend this product enough. It's incredible how much it lifts my mood. I treat drinking Athletic Greens like a ritual, waking up in the morning and taking it to start my day off right. It has replaced my multivitamins and it tastes really good. Look, with so many stressors in life, it's difficult to maintain effective nutritional habits and give our bodies the nutrients it needs to thrive. There's so many things we do throughout the day that can leave us deficient in key nutrients. This is where Athletic Greens can really help. Their daily all-in-one superpower food is the easiest and most delicious nutritional habit that you could add your daily routine and empower you towards better habits. One tasty scoop of Athletic Greens contains 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sources ingredients including a multivitamin, multimineral, probiotic, green superfood blend, and more that all work together to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet, increase energy and focus, aid with digestion, and supporting a healthy immune system, all without the need to take multiple products or pills. Athletic Greens is continually improving their formula based on the latest research, and they go above and beyond in third-party testing to ensure their customers continue to receive the highest quality and best daily nutritional formula on the planet. This product is also lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy free or gluten free, and contains less than one gram of sugar without compromising on taste. And right now, Athletic Greens is doubling down on supporting your immune system during the winter months. They're offering my audience a free one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase if you visit my link today. This is a really great deal, especially considering that a lot of health experts are noting the importance of vitamin D and its direct impact in supporting the immune system, especially during colder months where there's less sun exposure. Simply visit athleticgreens.com psychology and join health experts, athletes, and health conscious go-getters around the world who make a daily commitment to their health every day. Again, simply visit athleticgreens.com psychology and get your free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today. Hey everyone, one quick thing before we move on with this episode. Doing this podcast for you all is one of my greatest privileges, but the cost of maintaining a professional production like this one really adds up. I'm grateful to today's sponsors who help fund the show, but if you'd prefer an ad-free experience and would also like early access to new episodes, you can join us at patreon.com slash psychpodcast. You'll get early access and completely ad-free episodes, all while directly supporting the show for as little as $5 a month. That's patreon.com slash psych podcast. Okay, let's get back to the show. Yeah, it's, it, it sounds like, you know, it's a complicated, he had, an, he had a complicated ego. Like he obviously had a healthy ego, but, at, you know, what's all usually about these kinds of figures is how paradoxical their traits are. He also was into mindfulness. He was also, you know, like you just said, he was really like, he liked to be challenged. 
So it wasn't it wasn't all ego. There was there were other things going on there that may be even paradoxical. Yeah, and it's uh, it may it may seem paradoxical. And the the irony was that he was a uh, he was Zen Buddhist, and uh, the CFO took us public. Uh, Lawrence Levy was uh, was and is into Tibetan Buddhism, and uh, mm. I'm heavily engaged in the, the Theravadan Buddhism. <laughs> but it was funny. It's like okay, three <laughs> of us, and we never talked about it with each other. So we weren't trying to. <laughs> Yeah, it's just like we we never talked about it. But um, uh, Steve, while he had a powerful personality, um, he he learned how to be mindful of it and be aware of the impact. He knew he had an impact, but part of it was paying attention to the impact. And once you could pay attention, then his mindfulness of it and the way he worked with people changed. It was pretty dramatic change. Um, and uh, I mean, part of it too is he got married and he had children and um, has a very wise wife and this incredible uh, children. And the relationship with Pixar had turned into be something pretty amazing. Uh, his relationship with the Pixar directors was, I'd say, astonishing because the directors actually have to have a trait which Steve, Steve understood, and that was. If you pick an idea, you commit. When you really commit, you're going to make it happen. And then at some point you realize, oh, this isn't working. Then even though you said, I'm committed, now you switch, you change. You make the changes. And that's the, the thing that might seem paradoxical, but it was, it's actually the most productive in terms of leading a creative effort is the ability to have a bigger picture, to commit to it, and then when you see something isn't working, you change. You make, it makes differences. It's a really great insight. Yeah. So he, I mean, he wanted, ultimately he wanted to, to make it work. You know, he, he didn't just want, just, you know, if like his social status would be improved, but something didn't work, he probably would not be happy with that situation. Right. Yeah. It was, you know, it's like we've been to dinner several times and, Obviously, he's very recognizable. And he, it, it was the thing was he really didn't want that kind of attention. He, he what he wanted was impact attention, not the attention of being right. like a star or something like that. That's a great distinction, by the way. I, I just I love that uh, you know impact attention versus ego attention. Um, yeah, it, it's an important difference. It is. Um, and uh, when, when Steve put all those pieces together, I don't know, like 25, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, I guess. <laughs> it was 30 years. Um, that, the people who are with him stay with him for the rest of his life. And one of the reasons the hero, the hero's journey part of Steve's life didn't come out was that all these people were with him while he was alive. And so no, nobody was talking about the stories. So then he, when he passed away, there were any movies about him or writing books or articles about him, but they're all based upon the preconceptions of the early part of his life. And they don't know um, the change in his life because the people who are with him weren't talking about him. I wouldn't. I'm not going to psychoanalyze Steve while he's alive. It'd be completely right. inappropriate. Right, right. <laughs> so you look and say, ah, the real story is missed. The real Steve Jobs was missed in this in this in this whole thing but it was there was an arc and and i love it i think that we should and everybody every one of us should think in terms of like yeah we're arcs what is our arc and that is part of our own creativity how do we solve our problems what are we doing why are we doing it? what are our ethics and our standards i completely agree and also to be open to the fact that in a life, life is cyclical as well. We can have an arc and then go rock bottom again, you know, and then have another arc. Yeah. So it's not necessarily one arc in our life. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It never is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, uh, oh, is it? Cool. oh, I made it. I, I finally figured everything out. Exactly. Uh, okay. <laughs> that, that's actually the bottom. It's not the top. 
that that tends to be my experience is that I think that I've reached the hero in the hero's journey and then like a global pandemic will hit and it's like, oh, <laughs> forget that idea. Um, yeah, for sure. So you said, uh, I want to get to the Toy Story years, because you said on a personal level, Toy Story represented the fulfillment of a goal I pursued for more than two decades and I dreamed about since I was a boy. And I think this actually, this was a, this is a nice segue from the point we just made, you know, you, because you, in, in terms of arc, that's the perfect ending to the story, right? You could, if you're writing the book, you can stop right there. You dreamed of it as a kid. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, you, and you made the is your goal in grad school, and then you make this amazing, amazing, uh, impactful film. Some people say the best thing since Wizard, Wizard of Oz, but yet you still like you know after the release of that, you felt like something was still missing. You even started to question whether this was the the end point. Is that right? Well, not quite. The, the, I, okay, yeah, tell me the. Yeah. Okay, so we're getting close. Of course, there's a long story. I could talk a long time about it, but. We reached the point where the movie came out, and uh, and I will say, the people at Pixar understood that the goal was to make a good movie. So the technical people, who were you know doing the the, the part, that part of making the film, took immense pride, as did I, when the when the reviews came out of Toy Story. And almost every review had at most one or two sentences about it being computer animation. And the rest of the review was about the movie. So for the technical people, that was perceived of as the real success. And I took pride in the fact that, that this wasn't turned into, oh, we're showing how technically, how good we are. It's, that wasn't the goal. The goal was to have a, a new to basically create a new art form and to create great stories and art from it. Now, the thing about achieving a goal is that once I'd achieved the goal, I, actually, I no longer had it. Um, right. And just to make another film isn't the same thing as having the goal. Now, there are people who want to tell a story, and so they've got a goal of telling their story. But for me personally, um, the, the question wasn't, okay, what's, the, the, or the, for me, the next film couldn't be the goal. What should the goal be? And so I had two things up that I was wrestling with. Now, we had just gone public, so there, there was plenty to do. It wasn't like I was sitting around, with, like, what, what am I going to do? We're now a public company. We're making other films. And I've got these two problems I'm wrestling with. One of them, by accident, fell out of the book. Uh, so as I'm doing some re rewriting um, is to put this back in and try to figure out the right way to do it. But there were two, two things I wrestled with for a year. One of them was what is the next goal? And when I say goal, uh, to, for me, a, a goal is probably better described as a framework. If you, if you've got something really explicit, um, then that's not necessarily a good goal. Sometimes it is. But um, the, the question is, what's the framework to operate? What's the next goal? And, and by the end of the year, I, I realized, having watched what happened to other companies, why some were successful, why some fell apart, was, was, this was to address the question of how do we create a sustainable creative culture? That, that was the goal. That was the interesting problem. Um, so as we were making our next film, there was this Bugs Life and then Toy Story 2. Each one of them had challenges, but a big part of the challenges were the cultural, creative ones. So um, what if you okay, how do we do this? How do we help each other? How do we think about it? Um, technically, where do we go? So there are a lot of things that were there, but since we'd had with one exception, uh, one exception, a very strong culture, then the culture itself can't help but change in the face of success and, and growth, right? It's just like it's sort of built into what happens. So how do you make it sustainable? Not how you keep it the same, because you can't repeat that first goal. You can't make the first animated film again. 
or so it's just realizing all right whatever it is it's going to be different so what what does it mean to be different all the time so that was one thing that came at the end of the year was that realization the second uh question which i didn't talk to anybody at the time because it was just, to be honest it's like a little embarrassing to just to, to talk about this what was going through my head now i was very aware that we could only make have made this film if we had a number of people who were part of this some of them are well known so george lucas or steve jobs or john lasseter uh, um, pete doctor andrew stan so we got some people who are well known and have been very successful uh, and you know, Lee Unkrich was part of this original team that made this. It was really an extraordinary group. And I knew that all those people were necessary, but also there were people who aren't well known. <clears throat> a lot of technical people who made some very foundational changes in the field of animation and graphics. And they were necessary and integral to making this successful. And people don't know who they are. So I'm very aware that everybody was necessary. Now, having said that I'm aware of it, I still have this question. Everybody was necessary, but since I was the first one in this, how much of this was me? So I asked that question of myself. And I wrestled with it. Uh, and, I, and I recognize that other people will often ask that question. Um, Almost nobody will admit that they're asking the, their question. Um, but I was asking it. And at the end of the year, I realized that the, is it trying to answer the question is an act of separation. And I understand why somebody would ask it, but trying to answer it means you must separate yourself out from everybody that made it possible in order to answer it. And that's a bad place to go. So at the end of the year, it's like, oh, I shouldn't answer it. It doesn't make any sense. We, I did it with these people. There isn't this line and say, well, how much of it was, was me? Um, and, and for me, it was an important lesson that came out of this time. Was the, 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 the really the, the depth of, of the connections between people and all their contributions, and that it only worked because they were all doing this together. That insight influenced the culture that you created at Pixar itself, you know? Well, it's a, it, was, it, was, it was an interesting process to watch because, you know, everybody wants to contribute. They want to feel like what they're doing is important. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a lot of people, then then there's the question of, you know, am I contributing? Am I making a difference? Um, and people do want to make a difference. Uh, another thing that, that came to me was that if, is that if we're, when we're doing a lot of things, there are a lot of people who don't agree. Now they're realistic and people know that they don't all get their way. Um, and they, they understand that. But there have been many times when somebody will poke their head in the door and and they'll want to say something and, and, and they'll make a, a comment, a pretty strong thing about some sort of screw up that we're making. Now, the thing about that is, um, except for the people I've known for many years who feel comfortable, for some people, it uh, uh, requires some courage to come in and, and say to, President of the company, well, like, this, we just made a stupid decision. Like, this is really screwy. So the fact that they would do that says something about them, that they have that courage to do it. Yeah. The second thing is that uh, frequently they're just right. <laughs> they see things that I don't see. And for me, that's a fundamental principle is that I only got a limited view of what I can see. And the people who are doing work will see things that I can't see and I can be missing it. The other side of that is that I sometimes know things that they don't know. Um, not because I'm 
you know, I'm not a very secretive person, but you know, you have a lot of people there. It's not, not everything is known. Um, but what I, what I do believe is that if they have a view that it's critical to hear what that view is, they're, uh, they're, they're adult enough to know that not every view is going to be taken, but they need to know that somebody will listen, that they appreciate what they have. Um, and then I've always tried to do that. It's like somebody says something that, that I may not agree with, even if I immediately know they're missing an important piece of information, like where I do, oh wait, I know they're wrong and I can explain it. That's like, and, and, and explaining that to them at the beginning is just about the worst possible thing you can do. Oh yeah, no, yeah, not it's the like, best path. Yeah, I have to, to listen, yeah, and for a couple of reasons. One of it is my, uh, re, my me reaction just might be wrong. I really need to listen because they might be right. Hmm. Um, sometimes they're right, but um, there isn't much that can be done about it. But what they need is for somebody to have their, give them the respect of listening to what they say. Well, I mean, that's a really important lesson for all the sort of political fighting we're seeing right now and uh, the cultural wars. Um, so I mean, that, that advice is desperately needed uh, right now. Uh, your book talks a lot about the blocks to creativity and the active steps we can take to protect the creative process. This is a very interesting concept for me as someone who's research, I'm a creativity researcher myself. And um, I, I really, really like this notion of protecting the creative process. What do you need to protect it from? Well, um, for itself, typically. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, if you, I mean, we, we have one group, I mean, not every group can work this way, but we have something called the Brain Trust. Mm -hmm. And the, the name the Brain Trust originally came from Andrew Stanton. And uh, there were eight people that you could identify that, that were part of that original Brain Trust. Um, now, it's evolved over the years based upon the needs. It's no longer a group of people. It's the way we run certain kinds of meetings. So, but what, what made the first group powerful was they instinctively went there. And then the question was over time, what worked or didn't work? So there are a few principles for these, uh, these meetings. I say their, their way of running a certain meeting, then who, who is in the room, who's in the room might change depending upon circumstances or availability but the principles stay the same. So one of them is to work to remove power from the room. And this is a hard thing to do. Yeah. Um, but, and, and there's a good reason for why we try to do that. But instinctively, well, the reason it worked in the first place is that all of them had such strong personalities that um, you could, they could go to that place. Like th there wasn't really the dominant player. And so we, the rule was that the, the room itself, that group, the brain trust could not override the director. So it's the director's choice. And uh, uh, the, uh, the reason for that is that when you're coming in with a new idea, when I, it doesn't matter what the project is or whether it's a film or whatever, you're at the beginning stages, there are always problems with it. So when you present it to colleagues, then you're presenting something to them that you know doesn't work. So inherently, you're coming in from a position of being vulnerable. And if a person is feeling very vulnerable, they also may be defensive. And if they're de defensive and they're holding off ideas, then they're actually not helping themselves. So the reason for removing power is actually to try to address the problem of people becoming defensive and try to address the fact that, that for, for people naturally, they're coming in feeling very defensive. So we actively 
say, no, we want, we don't want power in the room. You can't override the director. The director knows that. And not only that, <clears throat> if there are, because every once in a while you have a disaster scenario <clears throat> and the disaster scenario, you may have to make some major changes, but we don't make those changes within two weeks of that meeting. And the reason is that we don't want to overload the meeting. If you go into a meeting and you know that afterwards people are going to get together and make a judgment, cut your project off or do something change, then it doesn't matter what you say about removing power. You've just screwed things up. So it's actively say, okay, what is it that would cause people to be defensive? Um, another part of this is that the people in the room are peers. That is, it's filmmakers talking to filmmakers. So it isn't the lessons coming on from high teaching people how to do something. These are all people who know how to, to make films and they have to be treated as peers giving notes. Um, a third principle is that of, of um, is that you need to be honest with each other about the problems that you see. And you can do that without attacking somebody what you're doing is you're working on the problem. You're not, you're not saying that somebody else is solving. You're just trying to help. Um, the fourth principle is actually not in the room so much as the fact that this process needs to evolve based upon the needs that we have. So there is a separate thought process and analysis about what works or what doesn't work. Now, um, it, I, I just come back to one thing on, on power. It doesn't matter if we say, oh, we're trying to keep power out of the room. The fact is, there are some people that are so experienced that by nature, they have more power. Okay. And people are going to defer to that power. So the rule that we've tried to have, I'm, I won't say we're always successful, <laughs> but the rule is that the strong, the people with the strong voices need to shut the hell up for the first 10 to 15 minutes. If a powerful person speaks to begin with, they set the tone for the room. And the trick is to, to let the conversation start and then a person with authority can enter a discussion and that's a different activity than starting a discussion. Now, in general, uh, these meetings work very well. The, the, the principles apply either to the note sessions after we screen the movie or to two day offsites. Um, that's when we would call something a, a, a brain trust. Uh, but there are other kinds of meetings. Not everything is run exactly the, the, the same just because of the nature of the problem or the nature of the people. In general, this way of working works very well as evidenced by the films that come out of Disney and Pixar. <clears throat> there are times when it goes off the rails. It goes off the rails for, you know, people do get defensive or they don't want to offend somebody else. Um, they want to look good. They're so focused on what they want to say, they're not listening. So there, there are human reasons are going on and, and they're subtle. Like nobody's going to say, oh, I'm really defensive or, um, I want to look good, pay attention to what I'm doing because what I'm saying is like this really clever thing. Like, that isn't going to happen, right? So this is all under the hood kind of stuff having to do with yeah. personal emotions sure. that are going on. So it, they, they do go off the rails at times. And, mm -hmm. and there are some people actually who are, uh, uh, they, they screw up the dynamics of the room. Um, but every once in a while, I'd say at least once per film, one of these meetings will happen that are magic. Mm -hmm. And by magic, I mean that ego has left the room. So ideas will come and go without people becoming attached to them. So you may offer up something to solve the problem. It doesn't go anywhere. Nobody cares. Like it just doesn't land. It doesn't solve the problem. What's my reaction? When egos left the room, it doesn't matter. You're not attached to the idea. Um, that's the ideal state. Can't always get there, 
But if you can get there, then it's, it's pretty phenomenal. It is phenomenal. I'd like to take a moment to talk about our sponsor, BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? For quite a lot of us right now during this coronavirus pandemic, we are struggling with our most fundamental basic needs, such as our needs for security, connection, and opportunities to master our work. I think all of us could use some therapy right now. I know I sure could, which is why I've really been enjoying working with a professional therapist at BetterHelp so I can realize the best version of myself even under the current circumstances. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, and you can start communicating with your therapist in just under 48 hours. Note that it's not a crisis line and it's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. There is a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. In fact, the service is available for clients worldwide. What I really like about BetterHelp is that you can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as you often have to do with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is really committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily. Here's a recent one. Camilla helped me turn my life around. Everything has been so positive for me since our first session. Deep gratitude. I'm pleased to announce a special offer for listeners of the Psychology Podcast. You can get 10% off your first month of professional counseling by going to betterhelp.com slash psychpodcast. That's better H-E-L-P slash psych podcast. Join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Also, another major aspect of the creative process or a barrier is, um, is when, well, let's, say, let's just stick with a contributor to creativity, is taking risks, being willing to embrace the unknown. This is another major element of your book. Can you talk a little bit how that's part of the culture at Pixar? Well, the, um, <clears throat> I mean, it, this is a very complicated topic. The people at Pixar like to take risks. Um, now, having said that, they also don't like to take risks. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> you can so, lose a lot of money. <laughs> Well, the the uh, and we we try to work out a, a balance. Um, the first thing to note is that um, we want you know roughly a third of our films that would fail the elevator test. Mm. So, you know, the whole notion behind the elevator test is that you get an idea, you get in the elevator with an executive in the company, and you are so concise and clear and compelling about the idea that you're presenting that by the time you got out the elevator that that executive is gonna follow through and do something with it. Um, now, the only way for that to work, frankly, is if the idea is not very original and it's derivative. So we want certain of our films to be the kind that you could not make a pitch that you could do, that is they would fail the elevator test. So as an example, what's the elevator pitch that would convince somebody that you should make a movie about a rat that wants to cook in Paris? All right. That's the <laughs> elevator test. Is that Ratatouille? Or Ratatouille. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or the movie Up, where with uh, uh, this, oh, okay, so we're going to tell a story about this old man, his wife has died, and because he's in grief, he ties a bunch of balloons to the house and he floats away, but he ends up with a stowaway uh, a scout on the house. Okay, it doesn't matter how successful the movie's going to be. You were never going to sell a lot of toy walkers. All right, it just fails the elevator test. Now, if you take on a project that's basically not very doable, then you have to be creative. You have to do something original. You've put yourself in a position where I have to do something different. And so about a third of our films, they need to be that. 
Um, when I say a, a, a third, when we do a sequel, if you say, well, okay, we want to make a sequel to The Incredibles. Okay, well, okay, that passes the elevator test. So somebody wants that, right? Uh, or, and, and some of the ideas when you actually say we want to do, make a movie about something, say, oh, that's, that's a, a good idea. All right, so I don't want to overgeneralize, but the risk part says we damn well better be making a certain percentage out of them, which are very unlikely. And so the culture is we should be taking some risks. Um, on the technical side, that we, from film to film, will make changes. And they go everywhere from a whole bunch of smaller technical risks that are there to, in one case, uh, we did this for Brave, where we completely swapped out, completely swapped out the, the animation system that we'd been using that we made every other film with. Uh, and it was pretty painful. Like, there was blood on the floor with this one. And, uh, you know, it was very difficult because new software and, and uh, you know, people had, would have RSI problems because they had to click buttons too many times. And, and so for all the pain that went through that, there was this phenomenal meeting after it was done. And uh, Jim Morris, who is now the, uh, the president of, of Pixar, um, but we met with just the users of the software, all right, the artists or, or the users, to talk about the process, because we're trying to make it better the next time we take on a big project. And we were going in, you know, preparing to have our heads handed to us. And uh, there was this surprising thing that was there. It's like, you know, this was really hard, but I'm so glad we did it. Pixar has to make sure we are, we're always willing to do something which is that hard. It's like, wow, <laughs> that, you know, that was really impressive. So that was a cultural value. Um, the other part of risk, though, is that um, people misperceive risk uh, often. If you say you're going to do something risky, uh, like have a new process, then it's usually heard of as the, the, the management of the film, that is the producers of the film, have decided to do something. And I think this is a bad idea. We're so screwed. We should not do that. All right, so that's the, that's the reaction. Now, the reality is an idea of having a new process in the film comes from the people who work on the film. So it isn't like you're going out and taking a poll on the street or have somebody who's working at McDonald's to say, how, do, how should we make better films? We're not doing that. The ideas are coming from people who are well-intended. Now, if you say, okay, we're going to try this for this film, then what, what actually happens is, if it doesn't work, and sometimes the new idea doesn't work, then you stop doing it. So the perceived cost of saying you're gonna do something applied to an entire movie might be high if it's a mistake. But the real cost, while not zero, is still low because as soon as you realize it doesn't work, you stop doing it. Hmm. But I think that's true in general across a lot of companies is that people get freaked out over doing something which they say is risky and, and they apply a cost to it which doesn't apply because you change it as soon as you find out it doesn't work. No, I, I love this approach. Um, so so you're, you're very comfortable with trial and error, I take it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, what, what, let, let's like build even further. What, what are other like core principles um, that you think um, make Pixar so creative? Because the movies are, are incredible and innovative. Well, there's, uh, I'm, I'll give one example. Um, and it, it doesn't necessarily apply to every field, but certainly doesn't in ours, is that um, if you think you're making a, a movie and for the people who aren't in this, they think in terms of the final product that they see. And so the pathway to get there is not visible to the people who were 
going through the process of making it. Mm. So if we go to that early part, though, is what is it that leads us to decide to make a movie? And the sort of natural thing, and uh, a lot of studios were built this way, is that they're looking for uh, a, a good idea or a good topic to make into a film, um, which sometimes can be it's like, uh, okay, we make certain kinds of film, we're looking for an idea, or, or they're looking at scripts that are written by writers, talented writers, to see what they should make. Um, now, that's a viable approach, and companies use that successfully. But we took a different approach, which was that we pick somebody to direct a film because we think they've got something unique in terms of their creative abilities and leadership abilities before we have any idea or before they have an idea of what the film should be. And uh, so the general ideas, and I say general because there are people like Andrew Stanton uh, or you know Brad Bird, like when they come up with their idea of what they want to make, but it's the same principles like, okay, that they've got the passion and the ability yeah. and they're going to do that. But the, 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 the more general case is we pick the person and then we give them like a year <laughs> to come up with three ideas. And the reason for three ideas is because of something that most of us experience is, is like you're working on something and you feel like you're beating the head against the wall and you're stuck. And sometimes if you go off and you do something else, then the solution comes back later. So we say, pick three ideas. As soon as you get stuck, switch to the other one. So for the next year, go back and forth between the three ideas. And, uh, and at the end of that year or whatever the, the period of time is, they then have got a rough idea of what three different stories might be. Then they gather photographs. Of the, they'll have some of the arts, some artists produce some drawings. They might get some images off the internet. Um, you know, there's, just, there's a variety of things they'll try to do in order to convey what the idea is. So now, now they've all been through this, and, and although they all play the same kind of mind game on it, because they'll start off the meeting when they're presenting, and it's about an hour and a half for the presenting of the three ideas, half hour for, for each idea. Um, and uh, they'll start off by saying they love all three ideas equally. So that's the starting point. It's not true. They don't. And uh, the job of the creative leadership is not to pick what they think is the best idea. It's to figure out which one the director really wants to make when they've just said that they don't care which one is picked. Well then. All right. So, and, and uh, basically, and every time it's weird because they come back and they say, oh, I was hoping you picked that one because that's the one I really wanted to do. <laughs> they liked that yeah. one, yeah. yeah. And, and, and sometimes it's, it's obvious that my, my favorite one was uh, on Coco. Coco is one that wouldn't pass the elevator test. I mean, it's mm. a movie about a, a, uh, the, the Day of the Dead uh, as part of the culture of Mexico. And it's not an obvious that film. Um, for this country. Uh, and <clears throat> Lee Unkrich came up with his three ideas. And um, the, uh, we do it differently with each one. But in his case, we had two story rooms. And story rooms are rectangular, which means one side has the ideas for a, a, a movie or film and all the artwork for it. And typically, it's covered up because you don't want the distraction of the other idea. But that's one wall. So it makes the pitch, you uncover the, the boards, pitch the idea, talk about it, there's a discussion about it. And uh, you know, and it's, and it's intriguing, seems like a good idea. And then they'll switch over to the other wall and again, take it off, go through this half hour long presentation and discussion. But there's only two long walls. So in order to 
go to the third film, we had to move as a group into the other room. So now we walk into the other story room, the table, both walls and the ceiling are covered with Mexican artwork. Now, without a word being said, I know which film we're making. Yes, yes. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And that's all we're looking for is like, okay, where's that passion? And it was, I mean, there's a lot of work and a whole bunch of things you had to do, but you need that passion behind it. And what you're trying to do is make the environment to let them do it. Because even though they've got the passion, they don't know exactly what it is. It takes a lot of work. They've got to discover things. And they have to discover things about themselves, too. These are, when you're telling these stories, they are, they are also personal journeys. Yeah. And they don't operate in isolation. It's not like the one person creates the whole story. There's a, a, a you know, the, the team aspect of it where the sum is greater um, than each of the individual parts, I think is an important part of this as well. You know, you have to you find these teams where they're all inspired to work on this together. Do you have your discovered an uninspiring team? Um, no, I've seen uninspired a team. Yeah. I've, I've seen a couple. So uh, and it's part of the making and say, okay, if sometimes the dynamic isn't working right. And I mentioned before that sometimes we have these difficult decisions that we have to make. We don't make them right around the brain trust, but um, we've got this, um, uh, the, this, the pathway, if like you got an idea, by definition, the idea is just the beginning. Like it doesn't work. So, what does it mean to go into a brain trust money meeting or a presentation and walk out and say, well, gee, that isn't any good. All right. That isn't working. Well, of course it isn't working. They're just starting. So you can't judge how well the film is doing based upon the state of the project. This is a hard thing for some people to get. Uh, the only real measure we have is, how effective is the team working with each other? And while they're going through these difficult things together. And the only reason that we pull the plug on something is if that dynamic within the team falls apart. If the director loses the confidence of the crew, then we have to do something. And that has happened. The painful, <clears throat> and uh, the reason the person was given the opportunity in the first place is because they're very talented. So you, you have a very talented person, but they can't quite make that step for you know, to, to make to be a director. Um, and so you get to the point where you say, well, it actually isn't working. We have to, in some cases, supplement, uh, but in some cases, you know, do some adjustment of who the team is. And uh, it's not easy and it's a very visible position. So it's difficult if we, if we ever have to replace a director. But we have done it. That is, the, once you decide to make a film, the commitment means you're not committing to a person. You're committing to ultimately a couple hundred people who are working together and trying to do the very best they can. And you have to make sure that the dynamic, dynamic for that team is healthy, that it's fun, maybe hard work, but they have to feel good about what they're doing. Uh, why do you think uh, the animation form of media is so popular? What do you think the appeal of anthropomorphic characters are in animation? What, 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 what's going on? What's captivating the human imagination that, you know, so much there? Well, in, in, the, in the case of animation, um, they are, if it's animation of humans, you've got caricature that you can put in there that is difficult to do with live actors. Mm. Now, there are times when you need live actors because our connection with the human face and the human body is extremely powerful, and that's the right way to tell a story. But sometimes you need the caricature to tell a story. And there are times in which the story is so powerful that you need the caricature in order to get it across. So there is a there's a, a rationale for why certain things are appropriate. 
it's a question that the studio will ask at times is like, okay, why is this an animated film rather than a live action film? I personally don't find that particularly useful conversation to have, but every once in a while, <clears throat> there is a conversation. And then there are some things where, like with Inside Out, it takes place inside the head. Okay, well, it would be weird to do it, uh, um, let's say, with, with real people. I mean, it, 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 the, the, the caricature <laughs> of it allows yeah. you to do something. But the other thing to note is um, that it, there's a common misunderstanding is that animated films are made for children. And even while Disney understood this was not true, um, is, and, and that is, we don't make our movies for, for kids. We make them for adults, we make them for ourselves. We are doing it in a way that makes them accessible to kids. But, uh, I, you know, we, we believe and understand if you, were, if you were talking down with the movie to kids, then first of all, they're, they know that <laughs> they're being talked down to. Um, and adults want to take a gun to their head. They want to sit and watch the particular uh, film. You have to make something which is for them, but it's accessible. And remember that children are wired to try to figure out what's going on in the world. So the reason they'll watch animated films over and over again is they're trying to figure out how things work. And if you've made it accessible, then you've got something which they can go over and over again. But fundamentally, it's to get some deep or, or mature themes in it with the comedy and the caricature that makes it accessible to understand. Obviously, uh, yeah, so that, that that's a great answer about the, uh, the animation part of it. But the stories you create as well are so special and um, really tug at the heartstrings. I mean, I, most recently, Soul really brought me to tears, you know, and uh, related so much to my own work in, on transcendence and what it means to li live a meaningful life. Um, what role do you play these days in... Um, well, interesting, you know, in, in, in the creative process at Pixar of, of, of these, of, of new movies that come out, you know, what's your day-to-day -day sort of involvement of the stories? Well, I retired uh, a couple of years ago. Hmm. So the thing about setting up for succession is that when you walk away, that if you set things up, then they are the ones who succeed you. <laughs> so yeah. that's the goal all along. Yeah. And, uh, as, as they address the new problems and, and they're, you know, if, if we look at what's happening today, the, the, the change in industry because of, uh, well, two things. One is the pandemic hitting just as, as uh, streaming is really taking off, changes the economics and the dynamics considerably. So there's a lot of work to figure that out. Um, and I was going in on a regular basis just to mentor or check in with people because I have a lot of friends there and I, I love them so much. Um, and then once the pandemic hit, I'm at home and that Zoom doesn't work for that kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, the answer is right now, I'm not playing a role in it. <laughs> but is anyone going into the studios right now or during the pandemic? Well, what they, um, they were uh, fairly well along on Seoul when it took place. So there was a productivity hit, but as they figured things out, they got um, better at it. So there's certain things where they did need some, some meetings to go in, be in the studio. But uh, as you would guess, there's some fairly strict rules in terms of safety and, and so forth. Yeah. Um, and as more and more get inoculated, then uh, uh, more things will happen in the studio. So they're trying to figure that out. And like a lot of companies, it's, it's, we, we, there's a recognition that we just ran through a forced experiment. So while Zoom and, and other sort of um, uh, teleconferencing have been available for a while, uh, with certain features and abilities, there's a question like, well, okay, how much do we want people to work at home? Is there an advantage? 
and uh, and you know you don't know how far to go, what the advantages are or disadvantages are, and it's easier to imagine the disadvantages. <clears throat> but when the pandemic hit, we don't have a choice. We have to run the experiment, <clears throat> and in the process, then the tools got better faster than they would have otherwise. Um, we also found that some things uh, were a little better uh, if you did them remotely, just because of the nature of the, of the information. It's like, you don't need to go waste the time going there. You know, you get on there and you talk with somebody and it's just as productive with easier use of, excuse me, uh, less impact on the environment. Yeah. So there are things like that. There are some things that work okay. They're not as good. They work okay. Um, there are some things where um, it's clear that you should be in the studio if, if you can or at work. Uh, and there are some things where you just plain cannot do them over teleconferencing. So one of them I was, I mentioned these two day offsites. The way they were structured and the way they work is not replicable with uh, teleconferencing. Like it's, mm. it's a whole, it's a, it was a powerful way of developing the stories and it's, it was gone for that year. Mm. Um, and another example would be something that we kind of take for granted. Uh, I have a son who's about ready to graduate from high school. So his final year of high school is during the pandemic. And basically, the, the last year of high school where kids are ready to start moving on mentally, but there's something about the social element of that last year of school that holds things together. The social element was gone, and, and for high school seniors you know, around the world, like, this really screws things up. And even if they can go back into school, which some schools let them do, they've got these social distance things, and certain restrictions on the social abilities. It's not replicable. It's like, like it, really, it really screwed things up. And so I, I watched these seniors, not just my son, but various others around it. It's like, oh, this is actually a terrible experience for their last year. So there's that range of stuff like it just doesn't work at all to, oh, it was better this way. Mm. Um, and now, we, now that we've got that information, and and uh, at least in this country, is I think we reached what uh, more than fifty percent. At least we received at least one inoculation. What was that right? Shot. Huh. Um, yeah, and actually, and in Marin County, I think we're up at eighty percent now. Where where I'm living right now. Well, California is like the best in the country in the country right now. Yeah. yeah so it's a. Uh, uh, and so now you see things starting to open up and uh, I'd say California has been pretty thoughtful right from the beginning to work through this, even though it's, you know, it's something they had nobody's had to do before. So it's a God awful mess and there are a whole bunch of mistakes made along the way. And, uh, but when I see the mistakes and it comes back to this, you know, are you, are you willing to take risks? <clears throat> uh, a lot of people, look at somebody else and say, well, they shouldn't have made that mistake or they shouldn't have done that. So they screwed up, but none of us knew we were doing. So you try something and you see what doesn't work and some stuff isn't going to go right. You know, it's just, and, and there's always somebody that wants to hold somebody quote accountable. I hate, first, I hate the word accountability because it, it has two meanings. One of them is, um, this is the positive meaning. If you have responsibility, and if you have the responsibility to do something, then you really should deliver on it. Mm -hmm. um, that's the positive meaning. The negative was, I mean, if you say hold accountable, that means like, oh, you just screwed up. And we're, we, you need to go to jail. Right. Yeah. Just so, desserts. <laughs> that's right. So we use the term typically in, an, in its negative phrase, which totally. actually diminishes the value of accountability. That's and a great point. So we say we want to hold somebody accountable if they made a mistake in the terms of, you know, whether it's, the, um, you know, in, in COVID or, 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 or treatment there. But you know, if people got the, the right intense intentions, 
then and, and they're going to make mistakes and okay we all learn from them yeah. let's cut some slack let's not politicize something because we accept sort of the reality of what happens and the fact that we're trying to do the right thing if we can pull it back to the folks on the problem rather than this being a personal or political event then i think we can move forward better well, i love that um... So you're not a big fan of cancel culture? <laughs> I don't even know what it means. Yeah, me neither. I, I, I mean, also I hear this term cancel culture. So what do they mean? Because both sides are both sides are using it. It's being used to mean, oh, I don't like your saying, so I'm going to stop buying your product. Well, okay. That idea's been around for a long time. I don't like your show, I'm not gonna watch it. Okay. That's always been true. What in the hell is cancel culture? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. You're canceled means, uh, yeah, you're, uh, so in some cases, people can get their jobs fired, I guess, and they can be fired from their jobs. So there is an explicit meaning of it in that sense, uh, you know, a clear meaning. But in other senses, yeah, it's it's more just like, uh, I don't I don't like you and I'm not going to do it, like follow you in anything you do. Yeah, so it, it has multiple meanings. Yeah, and that's, I mean, it's, it's been true before this, and it is, this, there's certain things that one does in environment which are fireable offenses. Mm. Um, but that's been true for a long time. If anything, the problem with a lot of cases, <laughs> in a lot of cases is people have done things that were fireable offenses and they weren't fired. They weren't, they weren't held accountable <laughs> in the second that, that's right. phrase. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so that's why I say the cancel culture was like one of those words that instantly was turned into a hammer without meaning. Mm. It's a, a weighty hammer without meaning. <laughs> uh, just as accountability is like a, a, a hammer without wisdom applied to it. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. I hear you, Ed. Like, what do you see as, as the, the future of animation like, like, where are things heading? I know you can't tell me the secret, the secrets, but you know, but what can you tell me about where Pixar is heading and what you see fifty years from now? We what we could have in store for us. Well, I mean, first of all, the obviously, what, if we're making a movie, then we don't go out and tell people ahead of time what it's about. But you know, it's an industry that's pretty small, and people move around for a variety of reasons, and so um, the the notion of Secrecy doesn't mean as lot uh, as as much. That's not true with everything. Like if you're dealing with national security issues, then secrecy means something different. Or in the case of like Apple's got products and um, and they're secret that's about that's it. Right. So so here's the interesting thing that and most people are unaware of this. <laughs> Uh, and, and the logic behind it, because Steve is thought of as a very secretive person, and he was pretty secretive, but he had a reason for it. And it was very explicit, was that if you hold things secret, especially something that's known about in the world, but the details are of import, then when you tell people about it, it actually gives you this enormous um, uh, stage in which to uh, make presentations and get attention. And Steve was very aware of that process of how do you get people to notice? And I say this because while Steve had this intuition about how he told the story of where his products are, or, or the films are going, same time he owns Pixar. Well, at Pixar, and this started before, even before Lucasfilm, when I was at New York Tech, we published everything. And the president of the school is fine with that. And then we got to Lucasfilm. We published everything at SIGGRAPH. George was fine with it. Now we spin off as Pixar. We published everything. Steve never said anything about it. We went on to Disney. Nobody at Disney said, why are you publishing everything? And for the last several years, Disney and Pixar published more papers than any other uh, company in, in SIGGRAPH. So what was the difference? Well, in the case of, of, of Apple, Steve had a reason 
for the secrecy, and he knew what the reason was. It wasn't just because of the nature of being secretive or, or paranoid. It's like he had a reason for why he was working that way. The reason he didn't ask us about our publishing, which is basically saying we're giving away all the secrets, is that we were playing a different game. What we were trying to do was to get the best people in the industry to come join us. I absolutely did not care about any particular technical idea because it was going to get discovered or found out by somebody another year or two anyway. So who cares what you want of these extraordinary people who think of these ideas? And Steve knew that. So Steve never said, oh, don't publish, you're giving away our ideas. That wasn't what we were trying to do. And also, um, if you take something like uh, Ratatouille as an example, suppose we told people early on that we were going to make a movie about a rat that wanted to cook. How much damage would it do to us for our competitors to know that we were making a movie about a rat that wants to cook? Zero. It would not have mattered. Good point. You know, because it's, you know, it's a story that they discover along the way. And it's that discovery and they're bringing their personal self into it. Like you really see in terms of the look of the film, Jan Pinka is the one who conceived the idea and the one who delivered the the final film was uh, Brad Bird. And that story is, you know, you, you, Brad Bird's soul and personality come out. What was the secret? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there wasn't one. <laughs> and, and in terms of how we work, I, if, in terms of like the brain trust, well, we tell people how it works. There's no secret there. What do you see as the future, you know, of, 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 of Pixar and of animation and, and exciting new horizons? So don't tell me secrets because I, I get it. There are no secrets, but tell me what you think. <laughs> what don't I know? Oh, uh, I, mean, it's, I mean, it's the thing I don't. No, also, uh, mm. because the hope, of course, is the culture has got the ability to adapt. And the challenge they have is that, that making work for streaming is, number one, it's an opportunity because there's sort of an insatiable appetite. It's sort of like television has an insatiable appetite for content. Um, but the economics are different. Our animated films are, are fairly uh, uh, expensive to produce because all the attention and the care that goes into them. So um, can we hold on to that or do we fall into the trap of saying, oh, this is about purely about the economics and so you end up uh, shipping off the work to be done some other place where they can make it for less money. Coming out of a culture where everybody is part of making the film. So our kitchen crew, for instance, you know, are, are employed by the company and they get the names the credits at the end of the, of the film because yeah, we're all in it together. All right, well, now the world just got turned upside down in terms of the economics and how it's d- distributed. And, uh, and so the, 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 the question is, okay, how do they adapt to it? So it, it just, there's like, how do I think it's going to end up? Yeah. I don't know. I honestly don't. <laughs> It's hard. It's hard to know. Yeah, where 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 it's all going, and you see uh, more and more of a uh, appreciation for um, inclusivity of of like diversity of characters, right? I mean, don't you see that trend continuing? Yeah, that all that uh, that that particular one started some time ago, I mean, if, because we had this awareness at Pixar that basically what we had were essentially initially all male directors Mm. and the um the people who were in the uh in the studio uh uh, the theater schools on the animation side were largely male um and so we represented the state of where it was at the boat when, when we started but we realized, well, actually, we have a responsibility because our job isn't to represent the current state of things, that we have a social impact in the world. So what do we do to actively bring in a, a, 
other ethnicities and bring in women in different roles and, and to, to be very active about that process. And uh, so uh, a lot of change, you know, got or was put into place. It's definitely had an effect. Obviously, you see it with Soul. Um, but there are a couple of other films where there's, from a, from a cultural point of view, a lot of attention to, to represent the real culture. So Lee Unkrich and the team working on Coco spent a lot of time in Southern Mexico in the villages because they didn't want to base a film based upon stereotypes. They wanted to, to capture the essence, which meant visiting people as well as having a lot of uh, cultural consultants who grew up there and, and know things and experience things that we didn't know. And likewise, Moana was the same thing for Oceana. Okay, so how do you capture the essence of a culture so that you then go back to the people you're representing and you show the film and are they happy with what they see or do they wince at what they see? So, um, so there are a lot of elements into getting that right. Um, but it, and it comes along with our own social responsibility to do something which is honest um, and impactful, which also means that it's going to uh, affect us. Because if, if we're honest about it, then it comes from the fact that say, well, I honest, I don't know. <laughs> so that's why you have to have people who've got different cultures uh, or, uh, you know, different genders, you know, as, as part of the making of the films because they represent the richness and no person has got all those understandings. And, if, and it was one of the lessons for me as I was getting near the point of retirement was that um, I, I reached tomorrow, I, I felt kind of guilty because I fell into some traps. And then I realized, oh, you know, I, it isn't my job to know everything. That's actually a trap itself. It's to understand deeply that people have got experiences and knowledge that I can't possibly have or cannot possibly get. And it's by trying to make an environment where that comes out that you end up with something which is powerful and impactful. Yeah, and uh, it also include uh, neurodiverse people on the team as well, like people who, like dyslexic people tend to be incredibly creative in their own way, you know, autistic people, uh, people with autism, uh, just the, the whole range. So include them in the table as well. Love that. Yeah, well, there's a thing, it was actually, there's a funny thing. It was, uh, one of the last things I did is, uh, as, as I was retiring, I went to every single group at Disney and Pixar. So these are like 30 to 50 people in a group to give my farewell thoughts. But at the same time, I discovered some time ago that uh, I don't have the ability to visualize. As when I close my eyes, I can't see images. Hmm. And, uh, and when I discovered this, it was actually surprising to me because they came up with the surfaces that we use for making that's pretty ironic. <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know, it isn't just animated films, but it's also for special effects and all those things. I have computer animated films of this surface that I did. And I didn't do it by math and I didn't do it by visualizing something. It was something else in my brain. So I took the test of visualization. I asked people to fill it out. And uh, it, was, it was very surprising. Um, but it turns out, Frankly, there's not a lot of correlation between your ability to visualize and uh, creativity or even your, your ability to draw. Imagination, either. Yeah, well, if, it's like one of the films nominated for an Academy Award yesterday um, was, um, no, Blank. Uh, Glenn Keane was the director. Um, yeah. It took place in the moon. Very, really a lovely film. Uh, and Glenn Keane's one of the best hand drawn animators of all time. Hmm. And he completely lacks the ability to visualize. Hmm. So if you watch him, the way he works is, is he, he scribbles the drawings. In, so what's inside of his brain comes out like it's embodied 
through his interaction with the paper, and it converges on this phenomenal work of art. And he's working side by side with people who've got these amazing visual abilities where if they, they don't, like I know one of them, he's only what, um, he never sees a movie more than once because once he's seen it, it's all, it's in his head. So you've got this range from this, it's called hyperphantasia and they're to having no ability whatsoever. And it's not strongly correlated with your ability to be uh, creative or thoughtful or insightful about something. Mm -hmm. so, which I thought was, was cool. So we can, when you have these misconceptions, well, obviously somebody who's an artist has to be really good at visualizing. No, they don't. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> and and the co-founder of Pixar can have a difficulty with visualization too. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, so I have, if, but if you talk, if you include in visualization, which some neurologists do, a spatial ability, then I'm very high. I yeah. have very strong spatial ability. Off the charts, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like okay, but the deeper things are manifested in different ways. Absolutely. How do we enable it? How do we make it so that People feel fine about it. If you could build a dream K through 12 school based on what you know about the creativity, the creative process, and the importance of including um, people with neurodiverse and other forms of diversity, like what, what would the, such a school look like? Have you ever thought about that? Well, uh, well first of all, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard problem. All the rest of my family is in education. My father is a high school principal. Um, mm -hmm. My brothers and sisters were teachers. So I was the black sheep in the family. Black sheep. <laughs> because I didn't go into, uh, uh, into education. Um, but I do believe in um, the diversity in approaches because there are so many different ways of people thinking and, and teaching that I don't know that the goal is to come up with the, the right curriculum to be spread around the country about how to teach kids. The, the fact is there are some teachers who are extraordinarily good. It has nothing to do with the curriculum. You just have a, a, an ability to touch um, and affect people. And, and, and it's individualized. It's sort of like the visualization. They do it in different ways. How do we create, create an environment to allow that to happen? And frankly, the biggest impediment to it is just the economics, is that people in general don't want to pay for education. And to always bug the hell out of me over these years when I would see um, a, a funding bill for schools up for voting, and almost always the, the funding bills are defeated. Um, that there's a, you know, that they don't hit a majority of the people who feel like this is worth doing for the for the future. And so it always leaves them a little on the short side, not having enough. Um, and then you got this consequence of it is that in certain areas, and it's not true when I grew up in Sydney. When I when I grew up, there were only public schools. And the richest kid in the school and the poorest were all in the same social group. Hmm. That is that and for me, this felt very natural. Like, we're all this together. It's not, not, not that everything necessarily was harmonious, that everything was right, but everybody was in this together. But there wasn't a bias because this person, they were special because their family was wealthy or in, in this girl's case, her family was very poor. It didn't matter. But now I go to other places like here, here in California, where you say, well, there's high school, assuming the public schools have got some issues. So the kids from the families where they're paying more, let's say, money in the, in the system, the, those families are pulled out just into the private schools to the detriment of the public schools. Hmm. I don't know, what do, you do, what do you do about that? Um, you know, if, like if you're, if you're a parent, then you want the best thing for your child, which means you go and put them you know, typically in a, private school, but as a society, that's actually not a good thing to have happen. These are just, I mean, just tough issues. So you're asking me a question where 
Oh yeah. You know, I wander off a different thing, but this is this is a this is a hard one and an important one. Yeah, there are trade offs with anything, and um, yeah, no, it's it's hard one, but I. I mean, if I could just frame the question a little bit differently, and uh, it's just I like like Pixar movies instill such a sense of wonder and awe in the viewer. You know, like how could we possibly design schools to make the learning process more magical, like watching a Pixar movie? You see what I'm well, saying? Yeah. Well, we we did something um, uh, at Pixar. We we uh, formed this group. Um, they uh, uh, and they made a series of short films about the making of our film, and it was the the person at the time who was the head of Pixar University, Elise Kleidman, and the person who was the head of of the R and D for the company, the technical R and D, Tony DeRose, um, had this really strong passion for elementary uh, or um, K through twelve education. Hmm. So they produced a series, and uh, we entered into a relationship with Khan Academy. Okay. It was called Pixar in a Box. So uh, they they had a, a series of lessons where they'd have somebody doing the lighting or the modeling or the animation, the animation. And you'd actually see this, and there'd be some lessons that go along with it and some tools on the website um, to connect with something and using the films to get there um, or to, to hold them their attention. And uh, it was really a pretty extraordinary program. Uh, they made a, I forget, I think they did a, uh, some with ILM because at this point it was part of Disney. And also they did some with WBI. Um, but when a whole bunch of changes took place, then the program wasn't continued. Uh, so. Uh, uh, Tony and uh, Elise went out to form a little company for educational purposes to produce those kinds of things, either for companies or for schools. So part of it is where they want the education in part is it's a practical matter is how they founded this company. They got some initial support from uh, learning jobs. Hmm. Um, and uh, Oh yeah, she's and very interested in the education. Oh yeah, space. because she has a strong... Yeah very strong interest in that uh, in education. Uh, actually, it's very remarkable. Uh, but that's a, I love that concept. And I think it's, it's scalable. Me too. But how does one get the funding from the places that might do it? Because what you want is something which is relevant culturally so that people want to watch it and follow through with the lessons. But you're using something with the lessons to, to introduce the technology or the art or, or relationships or how you think about things or how you use tools. Um, and it takes a certain kind of expertise to do that. The expertise to make them is not all that broadly spread. So the schools don't have enough expertise to make it. It was one of the things that Tony DeRose found early on as he went out to give talks as he was giving talks about the math of the movies. And he came back with the observation is that the teachers, like the math teachers, are just dying for tools like this. Where can they get them? Because they want something. So it's just like, how do they get it? <laughs> um, also, I should say that, uh, um, that we also did something with the Museum of, uh, uh, the Science Museum in uh, Boston. Mm, okay, yeah. And so there was an exhibit about the making of the films. And again, uh, um, our team at Pixar worked with their team at the museum. And they had this incredible relationship. They worked very well together. It was very impressive. And then they produced this exhibit at the uh, Boston Science Museum. And uh, it was extraordinary. Well, it's, well, it was still touring. And I think it's now, it's going to be back in Boston again for another couple of months. But it, and it's been turning around the world. And so I can, it's a success, but it took the passion of somebody to sort of push it through. And then took the ability of Pixar to say, go ahead, like we'll fund you to do that. But where do you get the combination of both passion and the funding 
to help do something which engage children. And isn't that really an important thing to do? <laughs> For me, the answer is yeah. Yes. I, I mean, I just wish people invested more into education. It's a matter of priorities. There's a lot, there's a lot of money out there. It's just, it's how do we convince people that this is a priority? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Ed, thank you so much for coming on the Psychology Podcast. Thanks for spending so much time with me and for the uh, just truly pioneering work you've done um, for uh, animation and the movies and, uh, and just for understanding of creativity itself. Well, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Enjoy talking with you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, if you'd prefer a completely ad-free experience and would like early access to new episodes, you can join us at patreon.com slash psychpodcast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash psychpodcast. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.